Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Accelerate Yale webinar, The Future of Digital Health, Part 1, Cypher Health and Mass General Hospital. This is a first, the first session in a two-part series on the future of digital health, and I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Our moderator's name tonight is Rashida Bob, and she is an alumna of the Yale School of Public Health, class of 2003. Rashida has worked in healthcare for the last 20 years with a focus on digital health for the last eight years. She has worked in corporate investment and strategy at Express Scripts, Pfizer, and Bayer, and worked directly with digital health startups. Rashida is the founder and managing director of Bricks Health, which advises investors and stealth startups on product market fit, operations, and BD strategy. Tonight's webinar is brought to you by Accelerate Yale. Accelerate Yale is a global community of alumni and friends of Yale who are engaged in innovation, tech, and entrepreneurship. We're delighted to have today's webinar co-hosted by the Yale Alumni Health Network and made possible by the Yale Alumni Association's shared interest groups. Before we begin our panel discussion this evening, I just wanna make sure that you're familiar with Zoom as I know you all are. Uh, we are recording tonight's session and all participants on the session are muted. Our session will be one hour and we'll reserve the last 25 minutes for your questions. If you do have a question you wanna to submit to our panelists, please do so via the Q&A box that you see at the bottom of your screen. And you are welcome to chat with each other in the meantime, but if you put any questions over in chat, they won't be answered by our panelists. So uh, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Rashida. Rashida, take it away. Thank you, Wendy. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists that I'm really excited to introduce and bring to this conversation, Ann Prestepino and Randy Chung. Ann Prestepino is class of 2008, oh, sorry, 1980, uh, MPH, and serves as senior, senior Vice President for Strategy and Clinical at Mass General Hospital and Mass General Physician Organization, both located in Boston, Massachusetts. And her current role, and is directly responsible for all administrative and financial aspects, including the clinical, educational, and research programs in the Department of Emergency Medicine. In addition, she serves as a senior executive responsible for strategic planning for MGH and MGPO. She serves as the chair of the Board of Trustees of Boston Med Flight and is a member of the American Council, American College of Healthcare Executives and receives a Bachelor of Arts degree in Human Biology from Brown University and a Master of Public Health degree from Yale University. And Wendy Chung is from MPH class of 2003. We were classmates. Mm -hmm. Wendy Chung co-founded Cypher Health after working in healthcare and experienced firsthand the fundamental gap that was holding the industry back from moving towards more patient-centric care, communication. Also, seeing a need for caregivers to embrace technology the way their patients had. He developed the idea for a software as a, software as a solution, SaaS communication platform, that connected the two communities at critical points along the care continuum, and thus Cypher Health was formed. Prior to finding, founding Cypher Health, Randy managed BD for MD Land International, a, a accredited electronic medical record company located in New York City. He also consulted for Empath Consultant and was in sales at Abbott Lab. Randy received his BA from UC Berkeley and an MPH from Yale University in 2003. So I do have some questions for our guests and we are convening and talking about the topic of digital health. Let's start with a general question. Digital health is an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of different subcategories. Telehealth and telemedicine is a major part of both Mass General and Cypher Health. Telemedicine has also received a lot of recent public attention due to COVID-19 and the need to adapt healthcare delivery. Which other parts of digital health excites you and which do you think will change the healthcare system? Anne or Randy, feel free to chime in. Well, I, I'll, I'll start, um, and uh, you probably are wondering what's an old lady like me doing with this young crowd of, uh, of great new uh, talent coming out of the School of Public Health at Yale, but I, I am delighted to be part of this. Um, I, I think that, um, as Rashida has said, uh, everything that relates to uh, telehealth and what we're referring to as virtual care 
in, <clears throat> at our institution and in our system um, that, you know, is a suite of programs interior to digital health um, has been absolutely essential. I think certainly in our response to COVID. And I think what it's taught all of us, certainly in uh, some of the provider organizations, just how woefully behind we are with this technology. And uh, anything that we can do that's gonna translate uh, the needs of our patients to for greater access, for ease of communication with providers. And similarly for providers with their patients, um, we're interested in looking at. Um, we had an opportunity in our world, what we thought was leapfrogging uh, into this technology because of COVID. Um, if you uh, saw, and uh, we can discuss a little bit at some point in the conversation, some of the things we did, you probably chuckle because it probably seems pretty fundamental to those of you who live and breathe this world, but um, it, it made just an enormous difference uh, to the point where we are now, just as one example, uh, anticipating and planning for about 45 to 50% of our ambulatory work to continue to be done on virtual platforms. So that's how compelling it, it, it has been uh, for us to finally recognize the power of these kinds of tools. So. Um, I, I will leave it at that and uh, let Randy chime in. Sure, uh, uh, you know, just uh, piggybacking on what, what Ann said, uh, you, know, I, you know, without a doubt, you know, this uh, unfortunate environment has helped to accelerate, uh, you know, telehealth and tel telemedicine. And, uh, you know, I guess, you know, a, a layer ab above that is sort of uh, this idea of bringing to, uh, uh, you know, bringing healthcare to wherever the patient is. Um, and, you know, it, it's been, you know, uh, sort of a slow journey. Uh, it's, it's not anything new, but, uh, you know, it's something that's been accelerated as of, uh, you know, as of late because of, uh, of COVID. Uh, but, you know, for me, anything around, uh, you know, uh, making uh, healthcare more patient-centric, uh, more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, personalized, uh, and, in doing so, making it easier for the providers as well, and and that's that's something that is possible, um, you know, through you know through technology. And I guess I'm a little bit biased on that one, but um, you know, any you know, like remote patient monitoring, uh, telehealth, uh, you know, um, you know, digital therapeutics, uh, all these things basically are just uh, you know uh, net positives for you know, uh, for providers and patients. So there's just a lot that's exciting, I guess. Uh, and I think tel the, the acceleration of telehealth uh, is, I guess, one of the, you know, that anchor, I guess, now. So just an exciting time. Great. So over the first, the last few months, CMS and OCR, and people who are not familiar, OCR is a division of Health and Human Services. It's the Office for Civil Rights. They have made regulatory changes that have really expanded telemedicine, virtual care, telehealth. Um, how has this impacted your respective businesses and how do you predict it will impact digital health businesses as a whole? So the new regulatory that basically has expanded the mm -hmm. usage of the reimbursement for telemedicine virtual mm -hmm. care. Well, we're certainly hoping that it sticks. Um, I think one of the, the two of the, um, probably three of the, of the biggest uh, changes that uh, CMS or, or um, Health and Human Services was able to make during the uh, pandemic, and which I think, as we all know, is, is really sort of like a low-grade infection right now. We're, not, we're certainly not through. Yes. Um, but the opportunity to um, be paid for these kinds of services, have our providers uh, actually be able to um, you know, be reimbursed for critical services that they were offering, again, over one of several different platforms to have some relaxation about uh, some of the patient uh, privacy laws uh, that allow different different um, technical uh, options uh, for providers, um, and uh, you know providers should be okay with that and not feel uh, any you know concerned. Uh, still trying to do the right thing by their patients, but using whatever type of technology they had access to, the patient had access to for that connectivity, and then you know some of the licensure requirements, which is still. An issue and a challenge. Um, you know, a place like Mass General, uh, like many other institutions that uh, Yale alums certainly work in, um, is a huge referral center. So we receive patients from all over the the, uh, the country and all over the world, and uh, you know our practitioners have to be licensed in each state where they're providing telemedicine services. That's a hassle, and that is an impediment to great care. So those are the kinds of things that we would like to see even go further. And, and some of the achievements that, that occurred out of a crisis, we'd like to see maintained. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a big change. Uh, you know, it's, it's essentially a new care setting. Uh, you know, it's a, you know, um, 
you know, at, at home or, you know, outside the, the tr tr traditional, uh, you know, care setting. So uh, I think it's, there's going to be a lot that changes, uh, you know, be, because of the, um, I guess the rules being, uh, you know, loosened and, and, and hopefully uh, things like licensure and, and, and those types of things can be uh, adapted in a, you know, uh, a reasonable, uh, you know, safe way. Um, I guess, you know, other than that, it would be, um, there, there's a hope that, you know, th this progress can help, uh, um, you know, maybe uh, uh, um, uh, broaden access to care uh, and, you know, uh, in the access to tech the technology can, you know, enable this sort of access to healthcare, uh, ac you know, across the spectrum. And especially, you know, when we're talking about uh, underserved populations and, you know, um, you know, populations that are being adversely affected you know, during, during this time, um, you know, that's, that's the ideal of technology. You know, it, it, it sort of lifts, you know, it's a tide that sort of lifts uh, all boats. Um, so hopefully, you know, the, the this first sign of the, the, the you know, loosened restrictions will, will be, uh, uh, you know, accelerate things to that, you know, to that end. Makes sense. We need a lot of acceleration in healthcare. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. The more acceleration, the better. This is true. So, okay. um, so in, in the field of healthcare and digital health, the word value means a lot of different things. Um, there's value-based health system, but there's also this idea of that startups and technology solutions need to demonstrate value. And I would say that's one of the largest challenges that many digital health companies have had to face, especially newer ones entering the market. And can you explain um, what that means to you specifically in terms of at Mass Journal, what does demonstrated value look mm -hmm. like? And Randy, I'm gonna ask you a version of the same question. It, it's a really good question, Rashida. And I think, you know, um, again, going back any, uh, from the, um, maybe the altruistic perspective and idealistic perspective, you know, if we are gonna uh, have an opportunity to work with um, a new company, let's say in the digital health space, if it's gonna make it easier for the patient, if it's gonna make it easier for the providers, whether we're talking physicians, advanced practitioners, nurses, et cetera, um, that's gonna first you know, create a level of intrigue and interest. Obviously, you know, the quality cost relationship is an important component, the traditional you know, uh, kind of ways we think about that when we try and quantify value to some extent. Um, but I, I, I think it really um, also, um, any new developments, um, I think, are best done if they're done collaboratively. So, um, you know, in our organization, which has a huge, huge research component, um, we like to work with people that, are, that have interesting ideas and that want to work together to solve a common problem, as opposed to an innovator coming forward and saying, hey, I've got this new thing that will solve X, Y, and Z, and we may be worried about A, B, and C. So I think that matching of people who are dealing with uh, common problems and great uh, innovative folks that uh, can use and think of ways to use digital health uh, in its broadest definition to help solve those problems and working together in that development, that's what really creates value for us. Because then we know, you know that we're gonna end up hopefully with a product that really is gonna help. And one of the things that we did uh, just as, as a sidebar, um, in our response to COVID, we had so many people coming forward. This goes beyond the digital health space, but if you'll just yeah. indulge me for a minute, sure. um, that came forward with ideas to, you know, make every conceivable kind of device to, uh, you know, have all kinds of different, um, you know, uh, obviously uh, pharmaceuticals came into play, et cetera. We quickly put together a COVID innovation center. Um, that we had our research leaders really take hold of and manage to bring in that outside talent and try and match it up with the inside needs of the organization. And out of that, we're seeing some really, really interesting developments. It was very helpful during our response to the first surge or wave, if you will. But um, we think there's some longitudinal opportunity there. So value for us uh, also includes working together in terms of really trying to solve these problems. I, I think what 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 Ann said uh, for anyone you know that's uh, floating or in the early stage of starting a digital healthcare company, what Ann said about that partnership is it, it seems like a simple concept, but you know we've seen you know we've been around since uh, 2009, so we've, we've come across a lot of companies you know in, in 10 years, uh, 11 years. Uh, it, there's a lot of uh, you know what works in some other direct B2C businesses where it's like we're disruptive. 
you know, like, uh, which makes sense, you know, uh, but, you know, we're, we're not maybe going to partner as much uh, with, you know, the, uh, in, in healthcare providers and sort of just do it our own way. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to be successful. Um, you know, it's not impossible, but, you know, this healthcare is very much, a, and I think Rashida is going to mention it later, sorry, Rashida, this B2B to uh-huh. T sort of model. But um, if you don't partner with your end customer in, in, in healthcare, as, as in, in our focus has been the you know, acute care setting and hospitals and providers, um, it, uh, you know, you, you find that you, companies will pivot pretty quickly because they realize it's not going to work. Uh, and, um, you know, in, in terms of value, like what we know, uh, you know, we, um, I guess the change as of late is that, uh, um, you know, providers and, you know, hospitals are going through a very difficult time right now. Uh, if we don't, you know, more and more, if we don't have buy-in or, or can show value, not just to one area of the organization, but across all areas organization in some way, um, it's pretty much a non-starter, uh, you know, just because things are so difficult right now. And, you know, if, um, it, you know, the, at least digital health purchases are at such a high level, um, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, you know, sh- show value if it's, uh, you know, it's sort of a small niche. And maybe that changes after this environment, but I think more and more, um, you know, uh, that's probably be more the case versus versus less uh, when when selling to providers. So, uh, anyone starting a digital health company, make sure you make sure you partner. Like, you know, it's not a company unless you have customers, and you know, you, you, that has to be really well aligned. Really simple, and that's sort of dumb. I feel saying it, but we we've seen it enough times where that that doesn't happen, yeah. you know, for whatever reason, uh, and it just typically, you know, it just doesn't end. It 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 uh, you know, doesn't end you know, as 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 well. Got it. That makes sense, Randy. And Randy, I'm curious because I know, correct me if I'm wrong. Your company is a, is about ten years old. Mm-hmm. Um, how has this um, proven value? How has that changed in the last ten years from your first couple of years in business to now? Sure. Uh, you know, I think uh, for us, um, you know, it's not only a function of stage, uh, but it's also the the part of healthcare that we're focused in. And so for us, you know, this, uh, you know, uh, patient engagement or communication, let's say, helping to foster communications between providers and, and patients uh, in, you know, communities, uh, loved ones, uh, that, that didn't exist 10 years ago, really. Um, you know, like 10 years ago, we're talking about high tech, we're talking about EMR adoption, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> and, you know, in, in that, you know, so that, that was like a, you know, not even in the, in the, you know, in, uh, in the stars yet, but, uh, um, so now, you know, like it's, it's growing, but it's still very novel. And so it's a very, uh, you know, early part of healthcare. And, and so, you know, it's, it's less uh, of a commodity and more of an innovative mindset. Uh, and maybe again, like my answer to the last question was more biased because, because we're in that innovative mindset, you, you have to, uh, you know, you have to go back and forth and really work with your partner to, to figure out the best example. Um, and so we've been able to do that you know, over the last 10 years, as this, um, you know, as, uh, as digital health has gone from like, I think it was a billion dollar in investment. And, uh, in, you know, now well, last year was like 15 or 16. So it's really, really grown a lot. Um, but in terms of stage of company, uh, you know, we went from and we didn't have, uh, you know, we were uh, sort of a ragtag group of, you know, first time entrepreneurs when we started in 2009. So you know, uh, we didn't have, uh, you know, a multi type of, uh, uh, you know, a uh, team. So uh, we very much, uh, we very much look to, you know, the, the needs of our, of our hospitals and so forth, and basically just absorb everything they needed and try to find the best, you know, solution to that. Um, you know, over time, because now we work with, you know, uh, like uh, at a parent level organization, we're talking like, like 500 or 600 different parent level hospital organizations, you know, probably in the thousands of actual, you know, uh, uh, separate facilities, we, we've, we have a different perspective because we've seen, uh, you know, through what we do, we've seen so many different variations, uh, so many different geographies, demographics, uh, you know, so many different things that um, we have a little bit more of a ability to, um, you know, sort of uh, be more suggestive and sort of lead, uh, you know, some of our customers when when we think we've seen something before or have sort of a best best practice. So that sort of shift uh you know has has started happening in the last in the last few years and uh um so there's like different types of i guess uh changes you know 
throughout you know throughout the last ten years. Thanks. Okay, so you're, we're talking about shift. So there's, um, you know, you, and Randy also mentioned this earlier, most of digital health companies have a B to B to C model, where the middle B could be a health system, a large health system like Mass General, um, a pharmaceutical company, a payer, insurer. Um, and the, the C, of course, are the consumers, the patients, any one of us who are listening. What I am curious about is how the needs of the, the C part of this, the patients have changed over the last few years and specifically, of course, over the last few months um, as America has been dealing with the COVID epidemic. So if um, I don't know if you have any insight or anecdotes that you can share about the patient's needs in digital health these days. I, some of this may, again, sound a little bit old school, but I think, I mean, first and foremost, it's access. Access to you know information, access to providers, access to um, anything in the healthcare spectrum that is going to um, you know from a preventive service to the most intense kind of referral that you know might be for transplantation as an example. And how and and how do they uh, really go about getting that information and um, having that connectivity? So I I think that's still king. Um, you know, we see it every day in terms of the, um, you know, like to say we're really good at the hard stuff, but we fail at the easy stuff, which mm -hmm. ought to be being able to, you know, have those very active conversations with patients, their caregivers, their referring physicians, and whoever does that well is going to win in this game, in my opinion. Uh, that is just so essential. And, and people, and, you know, um, the, you know, the generations that are uh, beginning, entering the workforce now and are early in the workforce, um, they're not going to tolerate the kinds of things that people in my generation did uh, in terms of what it meant to try and schedule an appointment, something as basic as that, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that we have to be um, very, very vigilant about thinking about those things. Um, people also want to understand in a much greater depth, I think, what's actually going on in their care and how do you link, uh, think about, you know, physiologic monitoring and information that is gonna tie and make it much more efficient and easier on the provider side that ultimately helps the patient and linking that to um, you know, uh, electronic medical records, billing, those kinds of things. Again, it seems like real fundamental kind of work, but I, no one's cracked the code on that, at least in my experience and done it as well as it could be. That's ultimately gonna help the patient as well um, because you know, we're living in a very complex world as it relates to healthcare economics. We don't have time to go into that tonight, but um, you know, things that can help in that domain, I think are really important as well. Um, I, I, and I think that the, um, the whole issue of uh, training becomes very important as well. How do we leverage digital health as ways to train the future generation? This is now more on the provider side, but yeah. um, you know, we have certain, I mean, these are little apps as an example, but that are really helping to figure out, you know, what does it take to train a good surgeon? How do you evaluate a surgeon in training? Um, and uh, making it easy both for the trainee as well as the teacher to be able to monitor what's going on in that individual's experience. That ultimately has value to the patient as well. So those are the kinds of things that I think, um, you know, we're certainly thinking about and that I think companies that are interested in exploring those kinds of opportunities, um, it's gonna be very, very um, important uh, going forward for the patients. I, uh, I totally agree with Anne and, you know, access is, is the key. Uh, um, you know, in, you know, telemedicine is this, in, in access, not just uh, in the traditional care settings, uh, and uh, you know, telemedicine is you know headed that way. But uh, you know, along with you know these slow-moving things like value-based care, you know, et cetera, uh, there's going to be more of a patient-centric, uh, uh, you know, weight towards um, you know the, what, what the patient wants, and um, you know, for right or for wrong, uh, you know, their ability to. Um, you know, uh, uh, choose or, you know, sort of, the, you know, their path in, in healthcare. Um, and even though we said that, you know, most of healthcare traditionally is B2B to C, uh, you, you have, you know, um, along with these, you know, directed, you know, direct to consumer, uh, you know, shaving or, you know, uh, like, these, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, socks or, you know, bedding or, gla you know, glasses, you know, these are, these are, the, what is it, you know, uh, Warby Parker glasses. Uh, you start to see, we're starting to see a little bit of that, you know, direct to consumer in healthcare, um, you mm -hmm. know, more maybe services based like fertility, um, you know, uh, and, you know, um, uh, you know, pharmacy or, you know, uh, services, um, you know, 
friend from uh, UPenn that started a, a, a thyroid screening uh, service as direct to consumer. So you, mm -hmm. you know, they, they mail uh, a thyroid, uh, you know, a screening, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a screener against, and, and then, you know, they can, um, that's direct to consumer. And so and it's starting to happen. I don't think it's going to, you know, I think it's more the exception to the rule at this point, but, um, you know, I think over time, it's going to be a little bit more patient centric as the way the money flows, uh, you know, is a little bit more in the uh, patients and, cons and you know, hands. Uh, but also, uh, again, for, for any of these things where it's a, it's a, a, a shared, you know, positive for providers and patients, uh, you know, it can allow providers to focus on, you know, what they do best or, you know, the, the um, you know, the important things. So, um, Things are slow, I think things are slowly changing, I guess would be my take. Well, things are changing, I agree. Yep. Um, and so we, we talked about the patients. Um, one reason why I wanted to have the two of you to have basically two different sides of the coin. So one is a provider of services in healthcare, and one is basically a purchaser and a provider <laughs> in the digital healthcare um, aspect. Same question, but just a little bit more focus on the, the health system side. Um, any information you can share about how the needs of the health systems, the clinicians have changed in the last few months or last few years in relation to digital health care partnerships? Um, I, I guess I would say that there's um, there are just many, many different um, pieces of this. Uh, so I think some clinicians have become um, very dependent in a positive way around that connectivity that digital health provides. Um, so, I mean, you can, you can think of, uh, you know, something as fundamental as um, remote monitoring for patients that suffer from congestive heart failure, as an example. <clears throat> How do you expand that kind of concept into broader and more complex patient um, situations. And, and, I, and again, I think it's the integration of the information. As much, it's not just the touch point, but, but what can digital health do to really provide the appropriate documentation and the appropriate analytics behind it? So, you know, it, and I think that that matters a lot to clinicians um, and for the healthcare system because of the efficiency gains that hopefully could come out of that as well. Um, the fact that, um, you know, communications also with, um, you know, family members or caregivers is an important component. As we talk about patient-centered care, we oftentimes say patient and family-centered care. Yes. Now, you know, assuming that we're doing the right thing from patient confidentiality perspective, you know, how do you make that easier? Even when a patient's an inpatient, I mean, during COVID, we were doing all kinds of MacGyver kinds of stuff that really helped the providers. So, you know, putting iPads on, on um, IV poles and being able to wheel them in and out of patient rooms and, and almost using them as a visual intercom for staff, but also for families who, who couldn't come in and who could visit with patients that way. Um, it, it was pretty basic, I gotta tell you, a little bit of you know, duct tape goes a long way, but it made a huge difference. And you know, without that just very fundamental kind of tool from the digital health world. So you think about, God, how could you expand upon that that would really deepen that connectivity and have the depth of analytic behind it that's going to support, you know, if you're looking at broad um, groups of patients and what are you finding from that from a research perspective that would help in the ongoing care of those patients because you're now seeing certain trends come out of that. Um, I, I think that is, is going to be a critical backbone of this. So it's not just the gadget. It's not just, you know, the, um, the, the forward facing component of a new digital health um, technology or approach. It's the analytics behind it and what we're going to learn from that, that I think is going to be a huge, huge difference on the provider and system side. We, we've seen the same thing as well, you know, over time, as I said, on the vendor side, um, you know, it's, it's great to have all these different things, but uh, if they don't talk to each other uh, and if the, the total isn't greater than the sum of the parts, then, uh, you know, um, that it sort of breaks down over time. Uh, so we, you know, we've been hearing a lot uh, from our, our, our customers and our partners, uh, you know, um, I won't say platform because I, 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 apparently that's getting overused now and <laughs> you know, it's getting a negative connotation, but, you know, a suite of integrated services that, uh, you know, can be interoperable and collaborative with, uh, you know, you know, the other services uh, that make sense, you know, for, for our customers. And, 
Um, that's not a, that's a very, it's not an easy thing, you know, inter interoperability, that ability to co collaborate, but uh, I think it's going to be a, you know, a, a table stakes uh, in the future because uh, to do what we really need to do, like if we can't have all these point solutions uh, that, you know, aren't uh, sharing the information between them to, to, you know, really come up with something powerful. Um, you know, there's a lot lost if, if that doesn't happen. So um, I think folks uh, as vendors, we've already looked at that. Like it's, um, it's not an overnight thing by any means. It's not, it's not easy, but that's continually on the, you know, our roadmaps uh, as a, as a filter to make sure that, um, you know, it's something that's improving, uh, you know, over time. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, um, just to reiterate what you're saying, both of you said it makes so much sense, but I think a lot of clinicians can complain of having to look at too many screens. Right. Um, and, and so how much can we kind of eliminate the, the burden while often making sure that the technology is delivering what patients need and clinicians need? Mm -hmm. That's really important. Um, so another interesting thing about healthcare, just shifting topics if, um, um, slightly, that any entrepreneur that has worked in digital healthcare or is thinking about launching a product is being aware of the long sales cycle. And again, I had the pleasure of having a purchaser and a vendor in this, in this conversation. Um, now I'm assuming that the COVID pandemic um, has thrown everything off. Um, I'm curious as to how do you think like looking at right now, any new vendors trying to approach new um, potential partners, how has um, sales implementation changed um, recently? And how do you think it's going to change even in the next upcoming future? It, it uh, again, an excellent question. Um, it's not surprising. Uh, many provider organizations are struggling a little bit from in, in economic terms. Um, yeah. Uh, knock wood, we're doing pretty good, pretty well. Um, but I think that uh, as we see, you know, what plays out over the course in the next year, <clears throat> it's going to be challenging just from a very, um, from the very practical perspective of, you know, people uh, not necessarily having the capital um, or even the operating uh, flow to invest. Um, again, I think, you know, I, I go back to Randy's um, excellent use of the word partnership. Um, there, you know, if people uh, can hang in there and, and we can think about some joint investment and further development, maybe around something that's already at prototype stage or even just really trying to solve a common problem, um, that's a way that people can, you know, people are so interested in that. The, the, you know, COVID has done nothing but raise more challenges and more issues to contend with. And um, they're always going to be there. So if people can, uh, you know, make that match with what they're particularly interested from a, a development of a company or a product perspective, uh, there are people out there that are going to want to work with you. Um, the question will, will be, I think, the economics and how you go about financing that, you know, mm -hmm. while you go through that development stage. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of people uh, that are going to have the resources in the short run to go out there and to be investing in something that's new and potentially um, of a higher degree of risk than um, you know, we might normally see just simply because of the economic circumstances. Now, I will say, and I think this is true of other major healthcare systems, so Mass General is part of a large system, used to be known as Partners, our name just changed, we're now called Mass General Brigham, don't ask me why, but <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, we, we do have an innovation fund um, that, uh, and a group that really focuses solely on working with innovators, um, you know, great minds, great uh, creative folks that really want to help us solve our problems. So we have that as a kind of backup, if you will. Um, so those kinds of resources will still be available, uh, even in light of the challenges we face with uh, the last six months. That's amazing. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's great to hear, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, that, you know, on the provider side, you know, trying to, to help uh, in a way, you know, the vendors as well. Uh, but, um, you know, for us, we uh, luckier than most, you know, things could be better, but definitely luckier than most, uh, you know, we we're in communications. And so we were able, it made sense actually for us and our customers came to us again, uh, talking about partnership. Uh, UCSF is uh, one of our sort of core partners. They asked us to create uh, a, a screening, uh, you know, communications, uh, you know, solution, which is sort of like a tangent innovation uh, off of the, sort of our core, you know, functionality. Uh, and we got it up and running in like less than a week, uh, you know, and so wow. 
Um, it, they didn't end up using it long term. This is, you know, this is the, the you know, the quick innovation sometimes uh, path, but because uh, they're, uh, um, it was screening for uh, incoming uh, uh, patients and they ended up turning off all those, <laughs> all those visits. Uh, but, you know, we innovated that to uh, um, uh, test results or just, you know, general, uh, uh, you know, post discharge or, you know, uh, you know sort of uh, community, um, uh, you know, uh, screenings or communications. Um, you know, for, for, for a lot of companies, if, uh, you know, if you don't have something COVID related right now, it's basically just, uh, sort of an, you know, uh, um, a delay, you know, and, and cause understandably hospitals are focused on, um, you know, uh, you know, trying to get through this, you know, difficult time. Um, that being said, you know, I think it was, it feels like we're starting to um, from our, what our customers are saying, you know, we're starting to see more of those conversations happen. Uh, so I think, um, you know, even though we're not out of the woods yet, uh, they realize that like, we can't stop, you know, you know the hospitals can't stop this uh, innovation, uh, you know, cycle or wheel. I mean, you, had, you know, it, it, we have to, you know, turn it on again and, and, and ramp it up, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, back to full speed eventually. Um, so, you know, for for a, a, a small, you know, health company right now, it's it may be difficult. But uh, to you know, to Anne's uh, point, um, you know, there are investors out there, and you know, for investment uh, to buy time to you know, basically you know, enable uh, uh, you know, trying out new solutions or uh, you know, giving you the ability to maybe sunset ones to you know, try new ones. Um, and the weird silver lining, I guess, is. Uh, because folks really aren't traveling right now, uh, it's it's a little bit easier to get in front of you know investors because you know you know they're not really go they're traveling anywhere you know they're maybe just as busy but uh, it's there's less variables at play so it's sometimes easier to get in front of uh, if folks and from what I understand like the, the you know uh, investment in health in digital health is still uh, you know humming along um, you know uh, it, it's it's back up to you know regular speed now so um, so that's good to hear. Um, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, for more established companies, it's probably, um, uh, you know, uh, time. Um, and you know, if you, in, if you get that through having, uh, you know, cash reserves so that you can, you know, get through it or, uh, you know, for some of our partners, we work with them so that, um, you know, we uh, ch you know, change our payment terms, uh, you know, come up with different, like push things out down the road. Um, you know, we, we buy ourselves more time, you know, to get through this difficult time. Um, you know, that's, those are some things that we've, we've, we've been doing, um, but yeah, definitely not easy right now. Yeah. Well, it's not for the faint, but you guys are both represent strong institution. So <laughs> we will prevail. Yes. So, um, the topic or the title of this session was called the future of digital health. And, um, you know, I live and breathe this industry and so do the both of you and it's prediction time. Um, I'm curious as to what, um, if we look at five years from now, um, when COVID hopefully is in our rear view, <laughs> um, what do you think are going to be the key um, innovations that are going to be part of the patient treatment cycle of healthcare? What's going to be the key topics in digital health, um, key technologies? And, and there were some things that were mentioned before, but I'm just curious as to what do you, what, what do I, you believe would be the prediction so we can check back in in five years and see. <laughs> yeah, I, and buzzwords. Just joking. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, some of it, um, I guess from my vantage point, um, not being a, a digital health expert, um, I, I, would, I would respond around, you know, what are the big themes and the big issues in healthcare? And then how does digital health find its natural uh, place in trying to resolve some of those issues and problems? So, you know, um, you know a hardy perennial, obviously, is payment reform. But mm -hmm. I think with a, with a different um, kind of twist, we'll really need to think much more broadly about coverage parity and be thinking much more about um, vulnerable populations and you know uh, some of the other issues in our society that relate to inclusion and diversity and boy COVID brought that home front and center yeah. in so many different ways in a way that you know shame on us we should have been probably paying even more attention we thought we were doing a reasonable job and we weren't and um, so how do we think about those kinds of issues we've talked a lot about equity and access um, you know some the relationship to artificial intelligence and how how what what how does digital health relate to artificial intelligence you know i don't have a clue 
but that clearly is going to be an arena. We see so much of this going on now already in areas like radiology and pathology, not surprisingly. Um, there, there has to be uh, solutions that digital health can offer as we try and advance uh, that kind of thinking. Um, and I, and I, the final thing I would say is just, I go back to um, you know, measurement and analytics. Uh, one of the things I'm responsible for is clinical operations. And you know, this is not forward facing to either the patient or necessarily the clinician, but boy, it matters a lot in terms of how you run your, your operating rooms, your catheterization laboratory, your interventional radiology, and you know, the kind of information you need, uh, the kind of modeling expertise you need to really make uh, operational hay and capacity management is, is really huge. So again, roles of digital health in all of those areas is what I see the next five years are gonna be about. Thanks, Anne. Analytics uh, and you know, getting more out of the information that we have, uh, or you know, uh, and improving the, the the data that we have, uh, and and you know that amount of data is only going to increase exponentially with uh, with more digital health uh, uh, you know uses and use cases and what comes out of that. So that's definitely something that uh, that's you know always uh, you know on our um, you know on our inner thoughts and our roadmap. Um, I guess we've been uh, looking, I guess, on the on the provider side, but um, we just see, um, just thinking five years ahead, and maybe this is sooner than that, but uh, just just more consolidation. Uh, you know, there's no surprise around the, uh, you know, the hospital or provider consolidation. Uh, just you know, um, you know, and uh, I think now maybe because of COVID. Uh, um, it's going to accelerate maybe vendor consolidation too, uh, you know, because just uh, it's very difficult uh, to to be in digital health as a small company uh, because of the long sales cycles. Uh, just things take longer, and um, something like COVID may have thrown off folks, you know, uh, plans around how much capital they needed to raise and how much time it would take to, uh, you know, get get uh, get get off the ground and running. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, consolidation maybe, yeah. Well, thank you, Anne and Randy. We have actually some questions I want to take from the audience. So I'm going to pass. Thank you again, both for your participation. I'm going to pass the moderation to Wendy to help us with the Q&A. Okay, thank you. Thanks to all of you. So some really interesting questions coming in here. Um, I will attempt to get to all of them, but if we don't, um, please don't take it personally. Um, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, there's an interesting question in here from Miranda. Uh, she says the following, as someone who works with healthcare facility designers, do you have any thoughts on how they can transition their ideas on facilities to accommodate and ease the transition to more digital opportunities? You mentioned duct tape, iPads, but I'm guessing from the architecture <laughs> interior side of the table, we can design better for these new needs. Um, would either or both of you like to comment on that? Go ahead, Randy, if you want to go first this time. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, um, that's interesting, ease the translation. Um, you know, the, the first thought that comes to mind is we actually had, uh, talking about innovation, I think four years in, uh, you know, it's like 2013, we actually came out with a, a patient tablet uh, we, that we call the concierge. And uh, it holds a special place in our heart because the first letter that we ever had written from a patient, uh, you know, to us, which is hanging in our uh, conference room, was from a patient who used that concierge. Um, but, you know, it's a very different uh, business. Like we're in a software business, but this is, you know, a hardware business. And, um, I remember, you know, uh, this is before iPads are, I think at the time iPads, iPads were too expensive. So we ended up using, you know, a, a sort of cheap, uh, cheaper Android or knockoff of an iPad. But we, uh, uh, we, we had to test cleaning the iPads. And so we, we, we had a, like 10 different iPads that someone would have to go in and uh, every like 10 minutes wipe it with like, uh, you know, a wipe. And uh, we had to do that for uh, days to see, does that have any effect on the iPad? Uh, and, you know, th these are like the very, like, uh, it just shows, um, you know, f for that, maybe that type of uh, product, uh, it's a, it's a very steep learning curve, uh, you know, uh, for, for hospitals. And that was a long time ago. We we're way past that. But um, I guess that's just me agreeing with the, you know, that uh, there could be more focus on helping to, you know, sort of ease the transition of sort of these ideas into the, um, into the hospital setting. Um, I think, um, I think, you know, what Ann mentioned is that, uh, 
um, there's more focus and more bandwidth being uh, given to these sort of things now because I think we realize uh, they're uh, you know part of care delivery now. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know uh, titles or people in hospitals that it didn't exist when we you know were had our concierge uh, you know so many years ago. Um, you have you know patient experience folks that are being hired from Ritz Carlton, you know, so, so as an example, um, you know, as of as of late. So uh, my hope, and I actually don't, this is my way of saying it, I don't know exactly the answer is, Anne probably knows better, <laughs> but um, there's more, you know, there's there's more focus, there will be more focus on on, on these types of things, um, you know, as providers realize that, uh, um, you know, they're, they're important uh, as to the, you know, the clinical delivery. Yeah, I, I'm, Randy, I agree with everything you said. I think the one thing that I would add is that, um, you know, if you're, if you're in the architectural space or if you're in the digital health space and you want to work with healthcare, you got to talk to the people that actually deliver the care, yep. you know, because yeah. that, you know, if I'm the nurse who's yeah. got to wipe those screens, right. you know, 15 times a day, oh I'm not gosh. really happy with that technology, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So I, you know, it sounds so mundane and it sounds so obvious, but people miss it all the time. I actually think, you know, a, a very interesting uh, opportunity, I don't know how many people are doing this, but, um, you know, is the relationship between people who are in the digital health business and world in healthcare and working with healthcare architects. Mm -hmm. Not that there's a tremendous amount of building going on, but there is a lot of renovation going on. Right, right. And to have that type of expert consultation as you're thinking about design, uh, whether it's, you know, a new laboratory, a new inpatient tower, whatever, and, and build it from, you know, from the ground up. We happen to, I live in an institution that has, you know, buildings that go all the way back to 1811, literally. <laughs> and, um, you know, basic infrastructure needs are a huge problem in different parts of the institution. We don't want to make those mistakes going forward. So how do you link that expertise with people that are in the, the you know, the, the design phase of anything in healthcare? Interesting. That's an interesting idea. Okay, thank you. All right, here's a question um, for from an anonymous attendee. Uh, many hospitals instituted hiring freezes due to revenue losses, but are now ramping up routine medical care and increasing telehealth. Do we anticipate hiring to resume soon to meet uh, increased telehealth demands? I it um, I think it's it's very much a um, situation by situation um, kind of um, a certain set of circumstances that we're living with right now, I guess. I mean, a lot of people, uh, some people did layoffs, some people did furloughs, some people had folks work from home. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the basic premise of, you know, who's going to come back and who's going to be working physically in, you know, a provider space versus who's going to be working remotely. So that's, that's one piece of it. I'm not sure that digital health is going to dictate whether or not how much more you hire or not. I think that's one among very, very, very many variables, excuse me, that is um, we start to come back, but we start to also change our whole delivery system of care, taking advantage of a lot of the digital health products. Um, the, you know, the roles that people will play, where they will actually conduct the work, and some of the different um, skill sets that you're going to need may change. Okay. Um, I have a, a, I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Um, this is actually around uh, privacy and HIPAA. So um, Manuel asked if, uh, if session, telemedicine sessions are encrypted, Anne, and if there, what happens if there is a breach of privacy. And someone else asked if, uh, hold on a second, um, Noah then asked another question which is related. Um, if there's a need for improvements in image sharing um, when patients are moving between MGH and other hospital networks and, and how you see that playing out um, from a privacy perspective. Randy can probably deal with the technical component of that better than I. Sure, yeah, I, I just know, uh, um, you know, part of the, uh, the, the CMS relaxing the telemedicine rules was saying, um, you know, you can use Zoom. You know, it's it's not made for tele you know telemedicine visits, but uh, you know you, you can use it. And I think initially Zoom wasn't set up uh, in a you know in a, in a, in a tight encryption method uh, for, uh, for 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 health visits, but uh, it, it caught on quickly. Uh, it, they they encrypted it quickly and they got it. So now uh, you know it's encrypted. It's uh, it's secure. Uh, but you know, but it's still it's still Zoom. So there's there's some you know there's interesting there. But it works from what I understand. It works tremendously well. 
um, you know, so you know that 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 uh, you know encryption or that security is uh, is is important. Um, I think that's just one part of healthcare security. Uh, we, um, you know, there's standards in you know healthcare security uh, like you know SOC two or High Trust, which um, you know we're we've gone through, we're going through right now. We, we're SOC two certified. We're doing High Trust, you know, this year and. Um, Honestly, I you know in the some of our customers are saying like you know we we're not we're not going to be able to use you as a as a partner unless you're high trust certified by you know this this year um, you know out of our 500 or so we got like two or three of those last year um, but I think that's where it's headed and so I'm worried for a lot of smaller companies because uh, you know you know uh, that is a very we had a team spent hundreds of thousands of dollars you know if not you know more than that. On just getting you know these certifications and meeting these uh, you know security uh, demands. So for a small digital health company that doesn't have that ability, uh, but obviously the patient privacy and you know the technology, uh, techno you know the security is just as important. I don't, I don't. Uh, it's going to be a diff difficult hurdle, you know, to to get past. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I would, and I would just on the NOAA question, the NOAA component of that question, Wendy. Um, mm -hmm. I I certainly agree. I mean, I think. We, we live in a society that's much more mobile, right? Uh, certainly than my generation. And people are not going to be necessarily in the same city with the same healthcare provider for, you know, multiple years. And we have to find ways where we can safely um, transmit and easily share all kinds of information, not just imaging information, but all kinds of patient information and make it much, 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 much easier, both for the providers as well as for the patients to do so. Thank you. Okay, let's get, try to get through a few more questions here. Um, uh, Jung would like to know what you believe to be some of the, the major or important international legal issues that might arise right now um, that would hinder solving, uh, might hinder the introduction of major health solutions down the road. Um, anything come to mind for either of you? The, 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 the international challenges um, are pretty significant before you even think about COVID and when, and think about, um, you know, uh, new technology development and how to share that. I, I think with COVID in play now, um, just a simple factor of having to move, you know, um, developmental discussions and ideas to totally virtual, not being able to necessarily, you know, see a site, understand the culture perhaps as uh, completely as actually living the experience is going to be a challenge in my opinion. Um, Again, I'm not. I'm speaking to all the process issues, not so much the technical issues, if you will. But I do think they're real. Um, you know, the travel situation and associated testing does not make things any easier. That's for sure. So in the short run, I think that that we're going to be hamstrung by some of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Uh, Here's a question from Elizabeth. Um, what is the preferred term, and this is for both of you, what is the preferred term for medical care delivered virtually that is standardized for the purpose of research and marketing and branding? I think it's important for there to be precision in terms to evaluate efficiency, affordability, and accessibility. So we have all these terms floating around telehealth and telemedicine and virtual medicine and virtual care and digital health and digital medicine. So can you talk a little bit about the standardization of those terms? terms and, and what they actually mean when you're trying to measure um, different outcomes? It's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I actually, to be honest with you, I, I just uh, uh, found it recently that, that, you know, telemedicine versus telehealth, <laughs> you know, just to be honest with you, um, you know, it was just slightly joking, yeah, but, you know, uh, I guess telemedicine being more clinical in nature and actual, you know, uh, direct care with health telehealth being, you know, all the associated, uh, you know, I guess wrapper, if you will, uh, around, you know, the, the delivery of that healthcare. Um, but as, as of, you know, virtual health, um, you know, uh, not, honestly not sure about that one, um, you know, how it differs, uh, you know, sometimes these are just, uh, um, to your, I guess to your point, it'd be good to have something, you know, more specific verbiage around this. Um, and, you know, digital health, um, you know, even di within digital health, you know, we, we're, we're playing, uh, you know, our company focuses on patient engagement, which is under the umbrella of digital health. 
even patient engagement is, you know, is uh, partly because it's a new part of healthcare. Um, that doesn't, it doesn't, it, uh, just by saying that, you know, it doesn't say a lot because there's a lot, there's a whole umbrella within patient engagement as well. So, uh, you know, digital health as a term is really, really broad. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot in there. Uh, to your point, you know, we probably need to do a better job of, uh, you know, being specific, uh, you know, uh, in order to be able to communicate like what we're actually talking about. Um, that's a good point. On what, on what the result is. <laughs> that right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you focus on the result, the nomenclature doesn't matter as much. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Okay. Um, let's try and get through the last two questions and then we'll, we'll end on time. Um, last two questions, I'm just going to tee them up. Uh, one question from Joseph, what advice would the panelists have for clinicians seeking to pivot into digital health careers? And then the last question is around uh, someone who has an idea around uh, helping people improve their emotional intelligence and health via an AI coach. Um, and any of your perspectives you, you would like to share on AI and, and the impact on how uh, people could, how reception around emotional and mental health. So digital health career, cl clinicians digiting, pivoting into digital health careers and AI and emotional mental health space. Well, I think clinicians that are interested in have a couple of different ways to go. I mean, obviously, depending on, uh, you know, their site of practice, there may be um, groups within their particular organization who have that responsibility or that interest. And um, the first thing I would do is ally with them and find out, you know, uh, what they're about. Um, how that individual's particular specialty might lend itself to some work and, and that person's willingness to uh, participate potentially even to begin with on a voluntary basis. From moving outside of the provider situation as a clinician into that arena, Randy can again address that probably better than I can. Uh, you know, even uh, you know, that transition to the, I guess, the, uh, the, the vendor side, or I guess, outside the provider side, uh, you know, someone, if you're, someone's a cl current clinician or on the provider side, I would start exactly where uh, Anne mentioned, you know, like the, you know, maybe not all uh, organizations, but many now, uh, you know, Anne was talking about the, the digital uh, innovation group uh, at Mass General. Uh, they, there is, you know, a, a team that uh, is focused on that, you know, in, in this day and age, just because, you know, where things are headed. And so uh, it doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't need to be a full-time role. I think there's right. a lot that folks can do in, in a true entrepreneurial spirit. There's a lot that folks can do, you know, time obviously not being easy to free up, but, um, you, you know, on, on the side. And so just, you know, uh, reaching out to some of these folks to see, um, you know, how can I help just doesn't need yeah. to be necessarily formal, but let, let me help uh, because I'm interested and, um, you know, can, can help the rest of the, you know, the rest of the team. Um, and then getting that, Getting that sort of exposure, you know, learning the the, the, the nomenclature, like the, how you know folks speak, learning more about the ecosystem, learning about what's going on, you know, the uh, the pain points, you know, uh, that that's tremendously va valuable in uh, maybe if, if it's you know if it's if it's something that's that folks are interested in going from the provider side to the you know to the to the vendor side and um, understanding having a good base and you know context of uh, you know, what um, digital health, you know, is about. And, um, you know, hopefully with that, you know, clinical background, it brings a whole added layer of, of benefit to, uh, you know, a digital health company. Um, um, do either of you want to say anything about the uh, question around AI and emotional mental health? Do you, have either of you seen anything address using AI um, to address these issues? I'll, I'll tackle that one if you guys, just because yeah. AI is just such a huge topic in healthcare. So yeah, please. Um, please. Um, I just think that I see kind of two categories. So for mental health, usually AI and basically trying to have someone have the robotic response of a person. So a chatbot. A bot, a bot, basically. Yeah. A bot taking the place of a practitioner. So that's mm -hmm. one way versus the AI on the other side that's used most most in pathology and radiology is around um, how machine learning, how you take in databases and make conclusions that could be even smarter than the human ability to make those same decisions. So those are the two like main categories that AI is in healthcare. Um, there's a lot, I mean, there's more than enough. Um, we need more innovations in mental health. Um, I haven't seen do the project. I say, you know, create the company, let us know. Yeah. But, um, it looks like they are. It looks like they, they are. are. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Okay. 
Yeah. All right, you guys, um, I'm so sorry. We have to end. We are now at the top of the hour. And, um, you know, what an amazing session. I just want to thank uh, Ann and Randy for joining us this evening um, and sharing their perspectives. Um, Rashida, thank you so much for moderating this evening um, and, and for pulling this together this evening. Uh, we wanted to thank all of our participants for tuning in this evening and for sending along your super interesting questions. Accelerate Yale would also like to thank the Yale Alumni Health Network for co-sponsoring this evening's uh, webinar. And also we would like to thank the Yale Alumni Association's shared interest group who always supports all of our webinars. A recording of tonight's session will be posted on the Accelerate Yale LinkedIn page, our Facebook group, and our YouTube channel. And all of those people who registered for tonight will also receive a, 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 a re replay of this session. Uh, we'll also post it to the Yale Alumni Association virtual events page on the Vimeo channel. Once again, thank you very much to Rashida to Anne and to Randy for a very illuminating conversation on the future of digital health. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks for our next session on August 12th at 8 p.m. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Stay safe.